ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, I'd like to welcome you to For the Quantum Grammar Shoot, the only podcast of its kind on the interwebs. I'm your host, Colin Jason Knight from Matthew Colin Glass. You may call me Jason. This is a podcast of opinion. This is a podcast where I take a look at different topics through the lens of the wonderful technology known as correct sentence structure communication parse syntax grammar, the technology brought to the public by the late Colin David Eiffel and Colin Miller. And today, I'm going to talk about authoritarianism. I'm going to talk about nanny state. And I'm going to talk about a plethora of things related to those concepts as seen through the lens of quantum grammar, through the lens of quantum grammar, logic, and rhetoric, the corrected trivium method uh, that I talk about. Well, I haven't really talked about the corrected trivium method per se. Uh, The trivium method is grammar, logic, and rhetoric. Uh, I studied that for a few years and got closure on it. And then after that, that steamrolled into me learning correct sentence structure communication parsing syntax grammar in 2017, in which case I took out the plain English grammar out of the trivia method and then inserted correct sentence structure. And so it's a very useful tool that I use. Now I have had some students, which by the way, I'm a correct sentence structure communication parsing syntax grammar tutor. I've been teaching this grammar technology for over five years uh, to hundreds of people all over the earth through confidential workshops and also via the 500 YouTube videos on my channel. Uh, But some of my students have said that they feel that or have suggested to me that I ought to incorporate the trivia method as a prerequisite into learning correct sentence structure. Uh, But I have not done that because I am not a trivia method tutor. I am a correct sentence structure tutor. I teach the grammar. If an individual chooses to learn the trivia method, that's up to them. Yes, it would be very helpful for them to learn that, uh, to prep them for correct sentence structure, to uh, learn it themselves. Uh, but here's the thing, it's, uh, it's not, I don't think it's a one size fits all thing. So therefore, I have mentioned it I have talked about it in my videos, but it's not a main focus point for me. I mean, it's great if that um, if that works out for certain individual students, but I've really, out of the hundreds of students that I've had, I've only had one or two mention that to me. So that's why I don't really make it a point to do that. It's a great tool, but it's not necessary. Anyways, on to the podcast. So I'm going to talk about authoritarianism and nanny state and things to do with that. I've been seeing a lot of uh, talk on social media platforms. I get a lot of enjoyment and humor out of observing different types of individuals voicing their, their opinions on the different topics out there, one of which is guess what would be called the Second Amendment issues. I have begun seeing veterans, uh, former United States military veterans, well not former, former military, known as veterans, come out on social media basically telling people that if they are not trained or certified in the use of, for example, an AR-15, that they have no business owning one, and they should do the right thing. So now we have, well, I mean, what do you what do you expect? I mean, not all military are like that, but in the end, the military are all trained in the authoritarian construct, chain of command, And really, if you really think about it, I don't know that there is a such thing as former military. Once military, always military, unless you really uh, put forth effort to adjust and stop and correct your authoritarian mindset. It's very hard to get out of that mentality. So 
I mean, you're going to go along with the program. And I discussed this in my last edition of the podcast where I was talking about how I've observed former military come out and do podcasts about telling the general public not to trust the government. Don't trust the government. The government lies, so on and so forth. And they'll go on and say that. And then they'll do a complete 180 and come around and say that they're, you know, totally loyal to the government. And in the end, you know, we got to back up Uncle Sam. And so you're basically telling us that your Uncle Sam lies to you. You don't really know when he's lying to you. Uh, But when the bullet hits the bone, you got to trust Uncle Sam, even though they lie. So basically, you got to trust a liar. That's just a huge dichotomy. Makes absolutely no sense to me. I was never in the military, so I can't really speak to the level of programming that goes into those those men and women. I do have a deep honor and respect for those men and women who do go into the military with the correct volition, uh, right? There are individuals who go into the military that don't have that correct volition. And by correct volition, I just mean in line with what I, the principles that I hold, um, if I find a commonality there. So, in essence, the Second Amendment, with my knowledge, was created so that... Well, it was created under the premise that, quote-unquote, we the people are the government. So the people are the government, the government are the people. Self-governing. So therefore, the government are no different than we the people. They have houses. They have children. They have families. They use the restroom. They put their pants on one pant leg at a time. Same as we do. They have the same opportunities that we we have. I'm talking about back when the Second Amendment was created. Therefore, if the government can have armaments, the people may have the same armaments. So that way, I mean, this was the, you know, the fiction system, I guess, attempt to create a geometric level playing field so that the government would never feel that they could just push something on the public that doesn't make sense, that everyone doesn't agree with, and then the public would be able to push back on that and say, no, no, that no, you're corrupt and we're done with you. In relation to what happened with Great Britain, Britannia and all that stuff, they, the creators of the Constitution and the amendments in that were, were trying to negate that situation from ever happening again so that the people would not suffer under the yoke of a government that was separate and different from them. This way we keep the government on the same plane as we are. And at any mo- moment, we can walk up to them and smack them and say, this is, this is not correct. You know, you, you are the same as I am. Rule one, rule equal. We're, we're here on this geometric level playing field and you can't tell me what to do That if I don't want to do it. You can't mandate that I do this. You can't restrict my travel if I've done no harm to anyone. Right? These types of things. That was the auspices that the, that the Second Amendment was created under. That's, to my understanding, that's how it happened. Of course, never mind the fact, you know, play the tape the whole way through. Never mind the fact that the nation, the past tense United States was built upon the genocide of a, an entire race that already was here in North America, existing, living scattered all over the land. Never mind the fact that the government that came into place was part of the people who conquered North America, okay? So from the get-go, 
The nation was built upon bloodshed and genocide. It was built on a rotten foundation. So I don't know how anyone can expect anything but a bad outcome in the end. How anyone can expect anything different to happen than what has been happening. Seriously, logically, karmically, how can you think that? So on a side note, the only way that I see that this cycle of negativity can be broken or corrected is if each individual takes jurisdiction over themselves, takes authority over themselves, creates an autonomous biosphere for themselves, for themselves and themselves only, without trying to force anyone else to do anything. And then exponentially that will reach out to other people and other people will say, hey, look what that guy's doing or look what that girl's doing. Uh, it's working for them. How are they doing that? And then they get interested in it and then they can create the same thing for themselves. And now we have a group, a growing group of autonomous individuals on earth. And that will eventually push or diminish, I'm trying to find the correct words to say here, diminish the fiction system, the nanny state, the authoritarianism, the rottenness. It will diminish that or cause it to uh, desaparecido, cause it to go away. At least... For those that do the, uh, the, for those who create the autonomy for themselves, this is what will happen. That's my theory, anyways, with regards to my own personal experience and the experience of those in my inner circle. So that that's I've just given you a problem and I've also given you a solution. So let's get back to the former military individuals promoting gun control. See, do I think that citizens should be, well, citizens, and when I say citizens, I mean it in the classic sense of the word, citizens being people who participate with the fiction system and do partake in some of the benefits that the fiction system provides. And by that, I mean, do you drive on roads that are maintained? Do you use someone else's currency, the fiction currency, etc., etc.? Do you use the fiction system bank? So you do use it. So that's what I mean by citizen. Do I think that citizens should be able to own fighter jets and laser weapons? and bombs, and nukes, and things like that? Well, why not? Why not? Because if you look at the government, and the things they've done, and the things they've lied about, and the things that have been uncovered about what they've done in other countries with regime over overthrowing regimes, and, and murdering, like, geez, one, one country comes to mind, Libya, Afghanistan, Iraq. I remember... Um, Geez, well, I don't think he'll mind. I had a, a, a friend who was from Afghanistan uh, that I worked with for a number of years. And they said, I cannot go home because my home no longer exists because the United States destroyed it. And now look what's going on over there. Look what's going on over there right now. I bet the majority of people listening to this have no idea what's going on over there. So that, this is just an example. Um, not sure where I was going with this. Other than to point out, just as the former military people that, that I mentioned have pointed out, that the government lies. The government lies. And they use the tax dollars of the citizens to buy these weapons to do these black projects and things like that. And what is the difference between them having the weapons and, and, and the citizens having the weapons? There is really no difference. I mean, we have 
in the past tense United States, a unique condition of state in that we have what we call the school shootings, the mass shootings, things like that. Um, <clears throat> but the government does the same thing, but on a much larger scale in countries that they don't belong in. <laughs> now, for what reason? I don't know. <clears throat> and say if you're in Libya and you see a military force coming into your town and just bombing and, and killing and fighting. What would you think? Do you think they're crazy? Do you think that that, that military force is, is nuts? Like, why are they here? We had everything. We were fine. We, we had educational programs. I mean, what did they have in Libya? Like, uh, when, when the children would graduate school, I'm pretty sure, if I remember correctly, they were given a choice that they could move on and go to college and choose their vocation. And this was all free, paid for by the government, Gaddafi and whatnot. They could do that, or they could go continue their education, or they were given a piece of land and they could farm it. And they were given a certain allotment to start their lives. This was, this was all free from the government. And boom! All of a sudden, a foreign hostile force invades, government's overthrown, Gaddafi is paraded through town, if I remember this correctly. It was a gruesome, grotesque sight, and boom, a central bank was installed, and, and now it is what it is, thanks, in no small part, to the U.S. Now, how different is that than any of the shootings that go on here. Do you know how many women and children died in Libya during that? Because of the invasion? And I call it an invasion because that's pretty much what it was. I mean, other people can call it uh, something else. Maybe they would phrase it, they would couch it in terms of Gaddafi was a, a ruthless dictator and that the we helped the rebellion overthrow the ruthless dictator and bring democracy to the country. Please do your research and find out exactly what that country was like under um, Gaddafi and the things that he was implementing and doing for Africa as a whole. It might blow your mind. Let's just say that people's opinions of what good guys and bad guys are uh, if you had the whole story, it might be a little different. If you take out that protagonist-centered morality, you might have a different, more sobering viewpoint. So this is the root of authoritarianism. It's fear. Many people just prefer to have a nanny state. They prefer, as who, who said that? Benjamin Franklin or, or George Washington, somebody said that, that, if you're willing to sacrifice your autonomy for freedom, then you don't deserve to have freedom. Do any of you out there listening to this right now feel that you have autonomy? How did you feel the last couple of years with as far as autonomy goes? How do, how do you feel about that? How did you feel about the mandates and things like that? Does this entity called the government have your best interests at heart, do you think? An entity that has been known to lie repeatedly still lies. I mean, goodness gracious, ladies and gentlemen, if you just look at the political theater that goes on day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. The theater, the lies, the ridiculousness, the ludicrousness of that, and yet everybody still participates with it. It's like... I guess the best analogy I could give is it's an abusive relationship where the government is the abuser and the citizens are the victims. But the, the victims constantly say, well, this time it's going to be better. Well, th this time they're going to do things different. We can trust them this time. Keep making excuses. And at the end of the day, it comes down to, well, it's the only system we have, so might as well make the best of it, right? Let's vote for the lesser of two evils. 
how's voting for evil been working out for you? How can you have any end result other than what we have right here, right now, today? How? So now I've presented a problem. And as I'm fond of saying, you present a problem, damn sure better present a solution. I have a solution for you. What if, instead of being controlled, as a start, what if, uh, instead of being controlled by these entities, you instead work with them and become a steward of your contracts? What if you could direct what you agree with and what you don't agree with? Allow into your life bureaucratically what serves you and is beneficial for all rather than feeling like you've been raped. What if you could do that? Well, you can. Well, Jason, how can I do that? Well, I'm glad you asked. You can learn correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar. Get closure on it. Go through all the processes that you need to go through. Study, study, study. Find a tutor. Take classes until you have complete closure on the grammar, until you know the grammar well enough to teach it to someone else on the spot under duress. And once you know how to do that, you're ready to go. Now you can create your autonomy. Now you can create your beneficial biosphere for the earth to see. And when the cosmos sees you doing these good things, good things come your way. That's just how it works. You may say, how can you prove why, you know, that's just another one of those things. It's just how it works. I don't really have any other way to say it than that's just how it works. That's how it's worked for any number of people uh, that have been successful in getting closure on the grammar and implemented it in their own lives. They see results. Bottom line, results. But it's up to you. You have to be willing to go that extra mile. So it's like, you know, people are so willing to go, you know, if they have a, a legal problem, they have no issue with just throwing thousands of dollars at an attorney to speak for them because they're too stupid to speak in a courtroom. I'm being a little cheeky here. So they have to hire someone else to speak for them. Okay. And they throw thousands of dollars into these things to get an arbitrary outcome. Well, why wouldn't you instead take those, take half of that thousands of dollars or even a quarter of it and invest it in learning correct sentence structure, uh, whether that's from a tutor or, or whatever it is, so that you don't have to give your energy and sweat equity to a fiction legal system to solve a bureaucratic problem when you can just solve it yourself using correct sentence structure. I mean, geez, you wouldn't even have, it'd be like a quarter to half of the amount that you would throw at the fiction legal system, monetary wise. It really would be, but people don't really see it that way. People would rather be sold on something as if it's a product that I need a guarantee that this is going to work. Well, that depends on you, my friend. You're the guarantee. How good are you? How much time have you spent? How much value have you invested in your education, your knowledge cultivation, and using correct sentence structure? It's up to you. You're the only one that's accountable for it. Nobody else. With a lawyer, you throw thousands of dollars at them to maybe win a case or maybe not win a case. If you win the case, then it's the lawyer. Oh, thank you, lawyer. Here's your thousands of dollars, you know? Thank you very much for all the work you did. And they do work. I'm not telling, I'm not saying that lawyers don't do work. They put a lot of work in, a lot of study. They've invested a lot of time and energy into what they do. If they fail, what happens? Do you then get mad at the lawyer and blame the lawyer? Or do you just blame the system? But I can tell you one thing that doesn't happen, whether win or lose, you don't get any credit or blame. But if you learn correct sentence structure, now you're put in the driver's seat. Now you take the credit or you take the blame. It's all up to you. 
I know that's scary for some people. Well, actually, that's scary for a lot of people. A lot of people don't want to take responsibility or accountability for themselves or their education. And that's understandable. And those are the people that prefer the nanny state. As much as they bitch and moan about it, they prefer it. And that's actually the majority of people that I see on the internet. No matter how much they complain, they still prefer it than to taking authority and jurisdiction over their own constructs. That about wraps it up for this one. Another one on authoritarianism. Hope you enjoyed it. I have done several other ones, by the way. You can look those up on the podcast. If you'd like to learn correct sentence structure, hit me up at the email address at the bottom of your screen and apply for a workshop. I'll set up a 10 to 15 minute video consult and you can ask me whatever you like. You can vet me any way you please, because rest assured, I'll be doing exactly the same thing with you. If you'd like to support this channel, you can hit the join button down below this video, and there are two tiers of membership. I appreciate anyone who joins either tier. The second tier, however, has access to exclusive content not available to the public. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.